I appreciate so much those that are um, helping us these these uh, last few weeks. Dutch, of course, coming in last week, he did pretty good, and uh, we appreciate that. And of course, Rachel's filling in quite a bit, and Jen uh, Trengel, who will be with us next week. Um, when things begin to wrap up, I I. I called Mikey and I said, Mikey, I, you know, I'm finishing up nine weeks of radiation and um, then I'll have some things that I need to do. And I'm not quite ready to get back in the starting lineup. I know it's short notice, but will you come? And uh, he immediately, of course, said, uh, whatever you need, I will do. And uh, I appreciate that so much. And I feel like God is giving us important words these, uh, these times when our young generation, well, I shouldn't throw Dutch in there, but <laughs> the younger generation is telling us things that are so important, and uh, I love it. Uh, Mikey is uh, an entrepreneur. He's a worshiper. He's a teacher, um, a musician, artist, painter. Uh, he and his wife, Shanna, they are a part of Victory Center in Wapakoneta. He's been there on Sunday mornings helping his father-in-law there. But he's always been available to us. And I, I, I so appreciate that uh, from him. I respect him, a young man of God, carries the mantle of uh, a minister of the gospel as well as business and uh, other things entrepreneurial things he's involved in but I just want to say to to him uh, as he comes thank you for being a part of us and helping us and helping me um, till I can get on the starting lineup again all right bless you love you man love you buddy thank you so much so good to be this isn't this isn't the guest place for me this is home for me Someone this morning said, they never met me. They said, you must be the guest speaker. I said, well, when I, when I first started coming here <laughs> to speak, my first time speaking here was over 10 years ago. So, yeah, the first time I spoke here was over 10 years ago. And they would, they would announce me as Mikey Lamb, the very special guest speaker. Not really, but. And then it was Mikey Lamb, the guest speaker. And now it's just Mikey Lamb because I'm, I'm part of this house. This house is ingrained in me. Apostle Tim is a spiritual father to me. Pastor Carol's been a spiritual mother to my wife and I. Now for well over a decade, I used to be one of those people that would just sneak in the back. They didn't know who I was. For 15 years, I just sat in the back and, and I heard a man pray from this stage one time and I thought to myself, man, I want to be able to pray like that. And for some reason, our paths connected, and he came to our church, and he recognized something in me, and we connected, and today I'm here, you know, but he always does this thing to me, like when you have me come to the church, you always put me behind <laughs> Dutch or Chuck or right in front of Jen or <laughs> someone who's incredible. It makes me feel like the little kid at the big kid's table, you know. One time I was up here and Dutch and Chuck were on the stage with me. Apostle Tim brought me up to pray. It was a national conference. And, you know, we're right in the heat of the battle of prayer, you know. And I've always been like the hype guy my whole life. They bring me on the stage and I, you know. And uh, we're standing here and I'm getting ready. I'm like a horse getting ready for the race, you know, like I'm, I'm ready to go. And Chuck Pierce waves toward me like this. And here I am, I'm national prophet Chuck Pierce has a life-changing word for me. So I stop everything I'm thinking and I walk over to Chuck, expecting to receive an amazing word. And Chuck whispers to me, he said, hey, I love your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> right here. And that's when I realized that these men are very powerful in the kingdom, but they're really just great men. Just like you, every person in this pew, we're normal people. Just because there's a microphone in your hand doesn't make you some superhero, some superpower. We're normal people that just said yes. I think I'm in a room full of people today that are just some normal people that want to say yes. Will you bow your heads with me? Father, I thank you today. I thank you for your word. I thank you that it becomes a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. 
Father, I thank you today that you illuminate things to us in hours that they need to be illuminated. Father, I thank you today that you whispered this word to me, Lord, and I know that it's in this season that you want me to release it in this house. So, Father, I pray today that you would bless the word, that you would bless these people, and that we would leave out of this place changed. Give me the anointing of Samuel, and not one word that I would speak would fall to the ground. In Jesus' name we pray. The church says amen. Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 3. The Lord highlighted this verse to me. I'll just be in the King James Version today to make it easy. The Bible says, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples, but the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Arise, And shine. For me, over the last 15 years, we've been praying about awakening. I remember a word Apostle Tim was given probably 10 years ago. said, uh, the alarm clock of heaven is now ringing on the nightstand of a sleeping church. I used to memorize these words. but uh, The alarm clock of heaven is now ringing on the nightstand of a sleeping church saying, wake up. And I believe that we've come through a season where the church has wakened up. We're awake now. We're not sleeping any longer. The church is now awake. We have arisen, but I fear that we're in a place right now where we are not yet shining. Arise and shine, for your light has come. Since the beginning of time, since the eons of time, there's been like a struggle between light and darkness. The Bible even talks about in the beginning that darkness was on the face of the deep before God said, let there be light. And then the darkness was canceled. But there's like a struggle between darkness and light. Good and evil. And it seems like the dichotomy of good and evil has been misconstrued in this current season. We're calling things light that are actually darkness. And we're calling things darkness that are actually light. Good and evil has been blurred. The foundations that we built the morality of our nation upon are being blurred to the point where we don't even know what good is and we don't even know what evil is. We're in darkness. I'll give you an example. Last Sunday, the holiest week of our year on the Christian calendar, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. On the same day that we're celebrating, our White House announces that that day is not the day of celebration of Christ, but it's the day of transgender awareness. There's being a transfer of light and darkness. We're calling things good that are evil and things evil that are good and darkness is seemingly prevailing in our world but I came with good news today light cannot be canceled by darkness (laughs) light cannot be extinguished by darkness light cannot be stopped by the powers of darkness John chapter 8, verses 12. I got to warn you today, I'm going to (laughs) preach. I might get loud this morning. I I know it's a good sermon when I'm spitting about three or four rows back. If that happens, (laughs) you know it's coming. John chapter 8, verse 12. The Bible said, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of light. I'm going to preach a sermon to you today called Enlightened. In a world when everyone wants to be on the cutting edge, in a world when everyone wants to be the new thing, 
God wants to do a new old thing. And he wants to bring light back into darkness. Man, I'm telling you today, the nation may seem like it's at its darkest, but the old saints used to sing a song that said the darkest hour comes right before the dawn. I came today with hope to tell you that even though it may seem like your darkest hour, it may seem like the darkest place you've ever been in, it may seem like your children are in their darkest place they've ever been, light's about to show forth in your situation. And light cancels darkness. Is anybody ready for light? Come on, is anybody sick of darkness? I can't stand it anymore. You know what happens in darkness? You go around not knowing where you're supposed to go. And I feel like I'm in a room with some people who have been walking around in darkness, stubbing their feet on the things of the world, not knowing where they're supposed to go. But I come to give you good news. God's about to flip the switch and you're about to see light come out of something you thought was impossible for light to come out of. Jesus said, I am the light. I'm sure that this brought everyone's attention back to Moses at the burning bush. Right? Moses is, is watching his father-in-law, Jethro's sheep. And he stumbles upon a bush that's burning, but it's not consumed. It's on fire. It's a great light in the middle of a, de of a desert place. Begins to speak to Moses. Tells him what his assignment is, where he's supposed to go. He found himself in the light. And in the light, he got his assignment to what he's supposed to do next. Moses says something to the bush. He says, who do I say sent me? Because if I say a bush on fire, they're, they're going to put me in the mental asylum. God speaks to Moses through the bush and he says, tell him that I am, that I am sent me. So when Jesus utters these words again, I'm sure that their thought goes back to that point. Who, who are you? I am the light of the world. Pastor Apostle Tim alluded to it. Man, all that we have heard about for the last month is this eclipse. Am I right? Our church is in a city called Wapakoneta, Ohio. It's the birthplace of Neil Armstrong. They call it Moon City. If you've ever driven past it on 75, there's a, you know how we have a gigantic Jesus here. There's a gigantic moon at Wapakoneta, Moon City. So they're expecting all these people to come into our city to the point where they, some of our friends own all, uh, all the McDonald's restaurants in the area. They sent, the city sent a letter to McDonald's and asked them if they would close their location. They sent letters to all the people in the town and asked them to have their groceries ready, to have gasoline put to the engines of their car. I mean, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard of. Why are we so obsessed with darkness overtaking light? They're estimating between one and six billion dollars is going to be spent on this four minute eclipse. Why are we so obsessed with darkness overtaking light? Why is the world so obsessed with darkness overtaking light? But I've got good news. That eclipse is four minutes. <laughs> darkness is temporary. Man, you should shout about that. Your dark season is temporary. Let me tell you something. The light of the sun never moves. The only reason we're having an eclipse is because something is blocking it for just a moment. The moon has no power to illuminate itself. But in a moment when the sun cannot be seen, the moon is a reflection of the light of the sun. That's what we are. In an hour when the sun cannot be seen on earth, we're to be the moon, a reflection of the light of the sun. This has baffled me my entire life. How does something that is just straight dust reflect light? You remember how you were created? The Bible says that God reached into the dust of the earth and he formed man out of his own image and he breathed into him the breath of light, the breath of life. How do you reflect him? Because he's the light. Light overcomes darkness. In my room, in my house, we have a trade ceiling in our master bedroom, and there is a smoke alarm on the trade ceiling. 
It's approximately 10 feet from the ground. All day long, that smoke alarm does nothing. It means nothing to me. I walk past it. It's nothing. But at night, when we flip the lights off, there's a little green LED light. <laughs> if you're obsessive compulsive like me, man, sometimes I find myself at 2 o'clock in the morning staring at that light. It's all I can think about in the room. So much so that I've put a piece of black electrical tape <laughs> over this little dot of a green LED light because it produced so much light it, it kept me from doing what I was supposed to do. It produced so much light that I wouldn't have to turn the light on to go to the restroom at night. I could see through the green light. <laughs> Even the smallest light in darkness produces enough for you to take the next step. You're wondering about where you're supposed to go next. All you got to do is find yourself in light. The, I prayed it on the, when, before I started. His words, a, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I first got into this thing, I always prayed about where God was taking me. I always prayed about the destination. And he gave me revelation one time that he don't have to give me the final step. As long as he gives me the next step, that's <laughs> all I need. Some of you are questioning where you're supposed to go, what you're supposed to do, what your finish line's supposed to look like. And he wants you to, for just a moment to get out of those rushing waters. And just think about your next step. That's why the Lord's Prayer says that he'll lead me beside the still waters. And when I, when I find myself in the still waters, that's when he restores my soul. And then he leads me on the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Light cancels out darkness. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. The Bible says this. You are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of Come on, preach with me. What's that? Darkness and into marvelous light. Do you understand that, that the writer here did not use an adjective to describe the darkness? It's just darkness. All darkness is created equal. It's darkness. That's what it is. But look what it calls light. Marvelous light, glorious light, extraordinary light. The actual word there means an illumination or an enlightenment of light. He's got, he's got a marvelous light that he wants to bring into the dark situations of your life. I know we talk about the nation a lot and the nation is in a very dark place. We also talk about the church a lot and there's areas of the church that are in a very dark place. There's places where the church is doing what that eclipse is doing and it's blocking the sun instead of actually illuminating the sun. And many in the church are blocking what the sun is supposed to be doing at this season. But it's temporary. I want to prophesy to you, you are about to enter into your greatest season of light. You're about to, you're about to have to put on some spiritual sunglasses because your eyes will not be able to take what you're about to see. Is it okay if I prophesy some good things today? It may seem like it's dark, but light is coming. It may seem like for three days you've been in a grave, but I'm telling you the, the stone's about to roll away and give way to great light. The Bible says that Mary came to the tomb very early in the darkest hours of the day. She could not see yet that he, that he was risen. She thought that they stole his body. She assumed that someone did something to his body. And she asked the gardener, she says, where have you taken him? In the darkness, light comes out of his mouth and he says her name. And he says, Mary, Mary. And she knew immediately that it was him. She knew immediately that it was him. Personally, I've been going through some dark areas of my life. I didn't know what the next step was. Not sin, but darkness where I didn't know what to do next. But I heard the Lord tell me, just take the next step. And that's the scariest thing in the world. 
the scariest thing in the world to leave comfort. I don't know about you, but everything in my house has been in the same exact place since I bought the house from Apostle Tim and Pastor Carol. I don't like change. I know where everything is. I hunt at a cabin that's on 400 acres. And I've learned to count my steps in the dark so I know where I'm going because I don't like to go in with a flashlight when I'm deer hunting. I know that once I get off of my quad, it's 428 steps till I make a right at the pine tree. That's cr- <laughs> You're like, he's crazy. Yeah, I know once I hit that pine tree, 27 more steps. 26, 27, and my foot hits the tree where my tree stands at. I'm a person who likes to know where I'm at in the dark. And I feel like myself and many of you have been in a season in the dark where you're not really certain that you know where you're supposed to go. Am I preaching to the right people today? If not, I'm preaching to myself. I don't really know the next step, but I need your light to illuminate it. Come on. I don't know the next step, but I need your marvelous light to illuminate it. If light fixes darkness, how do we make it shine? Martin Luther King said this, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 through 19. The Bible says this, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power enlightened the bible gives us a formula here for reaching enlightenment or being lit wisdom plus revelation equals enlightened If you have a problem, you need a solution. If the problem is darkness, the solution is light. How do we get to the light? Wisdom plus revelation. Wisdom is the quality of having experience, knowledge based on experience. Many in this church right now, you've got gray hair telling me you've got some experience. I'm a business owner, and I took over my business when I was 25 years old from my dad. He started the company 58 years ago. And I realized something very quickly. I'd walk onto a job as the young guy, and I wouldn't get respect. It got so, uh, the name of my company, I changed the name of my company so that my name would be on it, so that people would start to respect me a little bit. Because I was still just Jerry's son. But I learned something very quickly. If I wanted the project, if I wanted to, to land the contract, all I had to do was take my dad with me. He wouldn't have to say a word. He'd walk into the job site. They already all knew him. Everybody knew who he was. He wouldn't say a word. I would run the meeting. By the time it was over, they would shake his hand first. Jerry, so good to see you. Mike, you got the job. (laughs) And his experience opened up doors for me. Well, then my hair started falling out, and I started getting older. And now I've got the experience where I walk on the job site. I sort of became who he was, and they know me. So my wisdom has increased and it made doors open up to me the bible says that wisdom and revelation bring enlightenment so it's it's okay to be it's actually great to have experience in this thing it's great to have 30 years under your belt it's great to be have been an intercessor for 20 years it's great to have been praying for revival for 30 years but in your wisdom you also need fresh revelation the two balance one another out Have you ever been around a prophetic person that had no wisdom? (laughs) Do not give them the microphone, okay? Because they're just going to go crazy because they've got so much revelation. They'll tell you. I was was in a a car with a guy who was a prophet one time, and he was new to the prophetic. And he was praying for the lights to stay green when I was driving. (laughs) (laughs) Prophetic people are weird sometimes, am I right? They are. You know they are. You know it. They need that wisdom to balance them out, to bring light, right? You need both wisdom and revelation. Second Corinthians chapter 4. I'm going to read the whole Bible to you today. <laughs> the Bible says this. 
For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts, listen to this line, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. What does that remind you of? Transfiguration, right? Jesus takes his inner circle, Peter, James, and John. He goes up on a mountain. The Bible says that he's standing there and Moses shows up and Elias or Elijah, the great prophet, shows up. So here's Jesus in the middle of a dark world. And Moses, the great writer of the Ten Commandments, the one who, the one who knew God experientially, the one who saw him, the one who knew him as a, as a man, the one who saw his backside as he hid him into the cleft of the rock, the one who came down from the mountain with his face illuminated because he had an actual sneak peek at the true glory of who God was. I think that's a man with some wisdom and some experience. And on the other side of Jesus is standing the great prophet, Elijah, the man of revelation who gives us peeks into the throne room prior to the birth of Christ. So here's Jesus in darkness, standing between wisdom and standing between revelation. And the Bible says that his face begins to shine like the noonday sun. And he illuminates light in the middle of darkness. Wisdom and revelation create dark, create light in your darkness. The problem is, is that the church has tend to gravitate toward one or toward the other. I believe we're in a season where saints with wisdom and saints with revelation are going to combine, where we see the great light of his coming. Oh, man, I'm not preaching a gospel that's not good news. The gospel is the good news that the light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon us. Is anybody tired of darkness? Come on. Is anybody ready for marvelous light? Both the law and the prophets showed up. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. I'll give you another example. John the Revelator, the one who wrote the book of Revelations, says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. This is revelation. John's, John's telling people that Jesus himself was at the beginning. But then we get down to the... Clause B of, of that chapter, verse 14, the Bible says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. We experienced him. We've got wisdom of who he is. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You see another picture of wisdom and revelation highlighting the light? It's all through the Bible. Anytime you see light coming, great light coming, it's always preceded by great wisdom and great revelation. Revelations, in the book of Revelation, there's 24 elders, right? Elders are those with great wisdom. You see, I'm trying to show you formula. 24 elders who have great wisdom and experience but there's four living creatures who have great revelation. The Bible says that the four living creatures are constantly singing holy, holy, holy. Or different, different, different. Or separate, separate, separate. They're seeing God as he sits on the throne in a brand new way every time they see him. That's called revelation. Wisdom and revelation. And then the Bible goes on to talk about the city of heaven. In heaven that there's no need for the sun. There's no need for any light because Jesus Christ is the illumination of the city. Wisdom and revelation bring light. Wisdom and revelation are the pillars of being enlightened. Matthew 25, I told you I'm reading the whole Bible to you. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. 
Five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Arise and shine. Go ye out and meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps are going to go out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And that they, they that were ready went in with him in the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. That's scary. I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. They all had the revelation that he was coming. They all knew it. Not all of them had enough wisdom to have enough oil in their lamps. They all had arisen, but only half of them were shining. What if that were so for the church today? That 100% of the church experienced an awakening and we were arisen, but only half of us were shining. Do you understand that it's your responsibility to be the light in your circle? Do you understand that if there's darkness in your life, you don't have to pray the darkness away. You just got to shine brighter. How, how are your children ever going to hear about God? We, we made a terrible formula in the church where we thought we just got to bring the sinner to the church and let the man with the microphone do all the work and then we can save the world. When in reality, God built a formula that works perfectly. You come here, you get your oil filled, and you go out and you burn. And like a moth to a light, like a moth to a light, the sinner will be drawn to your light. Why are we not seeing what we've been prophesying? We're seeing awakening in the church, but we're not seeing awakening in the world. It's because we've arisen in the house, but we have not shined our lights into their darkness. Is anybody shining in this house? Does anybody want to be a shining lamp or a burning torch? I got to warn every person in this house today. You are called to be an evangelist. You are called to evangelize the people in your circle. You're called to let them see God in you. You're the only Christ that some of the people in your life see. Paul said it really weird. He said it like this, let not your light be darkness. <laughs> Sometimes you read Paul and he, and he contradicts himself weirdly. And he said, don't let your light be darkness. Don't let your light be like the eclipse. Don't let your moon hide what God's trying to do in your family. Don't let them look at you and not see him. How do we conquer darkness with his marvelous light, with wisdom and with revelation, with our experience of who he is and our brand new knowledge of what he's doing? All these ten virgins had the revelation that he was coming. Only half of them had the wisdom to have oil in their lamps. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Remember at the beginning, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Matthew 5, Jesus says this, hey, you're the light of the world. <laughs> you are the light of the world. You're a city that's set on a hill that cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick and giveth light unto all that are in the house. You are the light of the world. Jesus delegated his authority as the light of the world to you. Not only did he give you power, he gave you light. Acts chapter 2. 
The Bible says that they're all in one accord in one place. And there came a sound from heaven, like as a mighty rushing wind that filled the house wherewith they were seated. And cloven tongues of fire set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And God gave me some revelation about Acts chapter 2. They were all lamps. There were 120 empty lamps in the upper room. They had no idea how to evangelize the known world. They had no strategy to establish his kingdom on earth. They were just empty vessels, empty lamps. The Bible says that they went there. They had experience. They had walked with him for three and a half years. They gave up everything that they had. They gave up their businesses. They gave up their livelihood. They gave up their families. They gave it all up. They had experience. They had wisdom. But they were praying for revelation. God, open our eyes so that we understand. See, he would speak to them and they wouldn't understand a word that he'd say. They had no idea what he was talking about. He said, one day, there'll be another after me that's coming. <laughs> And he'll, he'll enlighten your eyes. He'll let you see. He'll open things up to you in a different way. You may not understand it now, but if you'll be at the right place at the right time and you'll be an empty lamp, I'll fill you with something. And the Bible says that 120 empty lamps gathered themselves into the upper room and they began to pray. And the Bible, poured, the Bible says that God poured out the oil from heaven onto them and their lamps were filled. And as they filled, they began to burn. The Bible says that fire set upon each of them. And immediately, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Today, I just want to pray over you today that you would receive brand new oil in your empty lamp. If you feel like you're not burning at a level that you were once burning at, I just want to decree over you today that oil from heaven will fill the lamps of those that are hungry. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. How do we like the world? We get filled. <laughs> That's easy, man. This is simple. The gospel is simple. How do I become a shining lamp and a burning torch? I allow the oil of the Holy Spirit to fill me again. But here's the problem. The oil of the Spirit will not commingle. What's that mean? It can't be mixed. You ever try to mix oil and water? You can't do it. It won't happen. Water is natural. Oil is spiritual. You're never going to be able to mix these two things. There can be no mixture. You have to set yourself apart empty if you want to be filled. How do you get filled? You empty yourself. Anybody want to be filled today? Yeah. Come on. Anybody want to be a light in the community? Anybody want to take what we have in here, out there? How many thousands of people have driven by on 75 since I've held this microphone in my hand that are driving in darkness, that are living in darkness, that I've got the power to illuminate in me, but I'm just not shining? Rachel, will you come help me? How many of your family members right now are living in darkness, waiting for great light to come when you've been the answer the entire time? How do I shine? I don't understand. How do I do it? My experience of him and my revelation of what he's doing in this season will allow me to be a shining lamp and a burning torch. Darkness doesn't stand a chance. <laughs> Come on, darkness doesn't stand a chance. Darkness doesn't stand a chance. I've already read the end of this story. I've already went through Revelation, and I've understand that darkness doesn't stand a chance. It may be a temporary season where darkness seems to be overtaking light, but it's only for a season. It's only for a season. Light is coming. Light is coming. And it's not going to happen in here. It's happening out there. It's happening in your living room with your children. 
I decree that light is coming to college campuses all across America because they're sick and tired of the darkness. I feel the weight of the word of the Lord saying darkness has an expiration date. Arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has arisen on you. people who know how to gather well in a building know how to have amazing services know how to worship in the comfort of our pews or do we want to be people who want to change the world the Bible said that after those 120 lamps in the upper room became filled and they were burning that they spilled out of that place And an unlearned fisherman named Peter, full of the Holy Ghost and with fire, preached a fiery sermon, and 3,000 were added to the church that day. And with a small handful of a group of less than what we have right in this little front section right here, the Bible says that within 20 years, they turned the world upside down I don't need 12 million I don't need 12,000 I don't need 1,200 remember Gideon Gideon you don't need all those all you need are 300 that are willing to do something about this This message may not be for everyone in the room, but I know it's for me, and I know it's for several. You're not called to warm a pew. You're not called to receive all this incredible revelation and wisdom that comes out of this stage and out of this pulpit every single week to not do something with it. To whom much is given, much is required. And I know this man, I know your apostle. And he gives you all he's got. <laughs> I don't know a church in America that has more foundational teaching on ecclesia, on prayer, on awakening, on revival, on the oil of the anointing, on the standing king, on the new era, on this end time harvest. Do you understand what you've been given? I've been in the churches where I've spoken and they didn't understand any of that. You've all been given such great wisdom and revelation from this stage. Go and burn. Today I want to give you permission to burn. Stand to your feet in this house this morning. Today I want to grant you permission to burn and you're sect. On your job site, in your family, in your home. The Bible said that Peter carried such a weight after he became a shining lamp and a burning torch that he didn't even have to anoint people anymore to see him get healed. The Bible said they would line people up. And what would it be like if you walked into your factory this week or I walked onto my job site where I'm about to paint and people understand the light that we're carrying to the point where they line people up just so that our shadows could fall on them. (laughs) That's what I'm dreaming about. I'm not dreaming about a gospel that has zero power. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not dreaming about a revival for just a few in the pew. I'm dreaming about billions. I'm dreaming about generations coming back to the heart of the Father. I'm dreaming about a light that penetrates darkness and darkness cannot extinguish it.
represent you well. Father, we repent today that we have not represented you well. We repent, Lord, that we've allowed the fire on our altars to smolder out. We repent today, Lord, that we haven't guarded the flame with our own lives. But today we empty ourselves of everything that's not like you. Today, Lord, we discard our old wine skin. Because we understand if you pour your oil into that old wine skin, Lord, that it'll burst and it'll all, it'll all be wasted. Today, Lord, we don't want one drop of your oil to be wasted. Why are you giving us oil so we can burn for you? Today, Lord, we trim our, we trim our lamps. And we burn them. Why? Why do we want our lights to burn? Because the bridegroom is coming. The bridegroom is coming. The bridegroom is coming. Man, when I was a kid and I was in church, every single week we talked about the return. But I come to tell you today, the bridegroom is coming. The bridegroom is coming. He has not forsaken his bride. He may have been delayed, but he's coming. Who's gonna make who's gonna make the door open? The, the segment of the door opening. The ones who had the wisdom to have the oil in their lamps are gonna be the ones that see the bridegroom come. Father, today give us wisdom. Come on, pray this prayer. Give me wisdom and revelation. May the eyes of my understanding be enlightened, God. Give me wisdom and give me revelation. May the eyes of our understanding be enlightened, God so we know what is the hope of your calling. Raise your hands in this house this morning. The Bible said there was an invitation to go to the upper room to experience the fire of heaven. I'm not certain how many started in the upper room. Thousands followed him. Tens of thousands experienced his miracles. I'm not certain how many started out in the upper room, but I know that after nine or so days, many had given up and there were only 120 remaining. And I know that in the world today, many have given up. But I'm hopeful that there's 120 remaining. I believe I'm in the room today with a bunch of people who say, I'm one of those 120. I'm one of them. I've been tarrying. I've been believing. I have not given up. I've held on to my faith. And I'm believing that God's going to do what he said because he's a man of his word. I prophesy over you today that there's a sound coming from heaven, like as a mighty rushing wind. Even at this moment, that there's a sound from heaven, like as a mighty rushing wind, that'll fill the house wherewith we're seated. Those of them in the room today, Lord, that have never experienced the depths of your spirit, I pray today that cloven tongues, like as of fire, would sit upon each of them and they would be filled with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Rachel, can you sing something for us this morning so we can worship? worship. Hallelujah, Lord. Worship. Thank you, Lord. Permission to burn. Hallelujah. Awesome word, Mikey. Bless me. I love it. Hallelujah. Awesome word. Awesome word. If he would just get excited. I sat there thinking about, uh, I was listening to you. I've got a lot of notes. It was awesome. I remembered back 
one of the first sermons I preached at uh, the Oasis, or was Living Word back then, but I would preach like that. I get, I, I get loud. I, and I broke my shoe one morning preaching on that, we, you know, that the devil's under a foot. And I, I thought that you reminded me, I preached so hard. I was stamping on the devil and I broke my shoe. Amen. These, and uh, it, it was, it was, it was back when we wore the platform shoes that were this. So now I'm preaching like this, but I preached it. Amen. We are the light. We are the light. Let's go out and shine a while. Amen. Let's shine. Let's shine. Let's shine. Amen. Again, thank you, Mikey. Bless you all. You have a great day. And uh, go and let your little light shine. Amen.